retail and hospitality. Women are underrepresented in the Order. few Senator industries. Senator Faruqi, you will be in continuation. We will go to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. How many residents in aged care have passed away due to COVID-19? And when did the minister first become aware that 33 deaths of older Australians in residential aged care had not been reported until today? Why did it take until August for the Commonwealth to change its reporting obligations for deaths in aged care facilities? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, so the number of Australians who have passed away as of 8 a.m. this morning uh, in, in residential aged care is 457, uh, Mr. President, unfortunately, and each one of those uh, is an absolute tragedy. And my condolences go to um, every family uh, of those who have passed away from COVID-19 to date, Mr. President. Uh, for a period of time now, the uh, Australian government has been working with the Victorian government through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre to reconcile the data uh, that is held in the Victorian systems with, with respect to infections and also deaths. Uh, as of the 12th of August this year, by agreement with the Victorian government through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, we have been using the Victorian data uh, and understanding that uh, that data would need to be reconciled. Uh, I, I became aware of the difference in the numbers this morning uh, when we were advised from Victoria that they would be announcing that reconciliation. I wasn't aware of what uh, the, the difference in numbers might be specifically until this morning and I received that advice through from uh, the secretary of my department this morning. Uh, and uh, my understanding, Mr President, is that the reconciliation process and the recording of COVID-19 uh, deaths in aged care uh, will continue. The Victorians are still working on that process as they manage the uh, process through their FES system and their births, deaths and marriages records. Uh, and so uh, we're uh, working closely with them through VARC to continue that reconciliation process. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Today, the Minister for Health announced additional funding to, to uh, support the COVID-19 aged care crisis. Why has it taken the deaths of more than 457 Australians in aged care and seven months of the COVID-19 crisis for the Morrison government to finally provide these resources? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the announcement that Minister Hunt and I made today was an extension of existing programs uh, to provide continued support to the aged care sector through the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so the, the first round of the so the first round was of the uh, uplift for uh, aged care providers was announced back in May. Uh, the retention bonus for uh, workforce was announced in March. The program to apply for one worker, one site was announced uh, in conjunction with the Victorian government last month. And so the, the measures that we announced today were actually an extension, a continuation of our plan to help the aged care sector work, manage through the COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, considering tracking deaths from COVID-19 should be a critical element of basic pandemic planning. How on earth is it possible that you did not know exactly how many older Australians in residential aged care had passed away from COVID-19 until today? Senator how Col oh. Order. My apologies. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I explained in my answer to the primary question, uh, by agreement with the Victorian government, we have since the 11th of August been using the Victorian data to reconcile Order. deaths in Victoria, Mr President. Uh, we, we had an understanding that there were some differences in the data, and Mr President, that, those, dif well, those differences have actually been publicly reported for a period of time. So, so we, are, we, we, the Australian government and the Victorian government, 
understood that there would be required to be a reconciliation to understand that. Uh, we've we made a requirement that aged care providers report all of that information into the Victorian system, Mr. President. And so that work has continued cooperatively. Uh, there are some differences in the way that uh, some of these, some of the deaths are classified, uh, and we continue to work our way through that process, Mr. President, cooperatively with, with Victoria. Order, Senator Cobbeck. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last Friday at the Daily Telegraph's Bush Summit, the Prime Minister acknowledged the heavy burden of restrictions on Australians, particularly in regional communities, who are limited in seeking access to essential and life-saving health care, education or work, and for farmers, their own property to manage crops and care for livestock. As a strong critic of the one-size-fits-all approach taken by state and territory governments on border closures, I welcome the Prime Minister's call for relative risks to be assessed on the whole. Can the minister please update the Senate on the steps the National Cabinet is taking to secure a national approach from state and territory governments on the definition of hotspots? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McKenzie uh, for that question. Uh, Mr President, uh, Australia is not built uh, to have internal borders. That is why our government is focused on keeping Australia as open as possible while managing the health and economic challenges that COVID-19 presents. Border management must continue to be informed by the public health advice, which is why we are determined to get a hotspot definition based on that medical advice. Based on that medical advice. National Cabinet Order. has asked the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee Order. to develop a common understanding of a hotspot across jurisdictions. The IHPPC will consider appropriate movement restrictions relating to a hotspot based on medical advice. This work is ongoing and will provide people who are living in those areas clear guidance on where and when they can access health services or where restrictions may mean they have to find alternative arrangements. States do not have to wait, of course, for national cabinet to bring forward Order. common sense, practical and compassionate solutions uh, to their border Order issues. On my left. Senator as New Pratt. South Wales, as the uh, Barry Jickland governor of New South Wales has already Senator shown Pratt. by announcing a border bubble with Victoria, states can enact sensible exemptions, compassionate exemptions, common sense, practical exemptions right now by listening to and working with local communities in affected areas. The health challenge is significant. But we ask all state governments to continue to work constructively to resolve issues affecting the economic recovery. We need to ensure relevant exemptions are in place and applied consistently and efficiently so that disruptions to critical services for border residents and all other Australians are minimised as much as possible. We are doing everything possible to help our border communities and the agricultural industry in particular get through this pandemic, and we call Order. on all Senator to Coleman. join us in that effort. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. The impacts on border residents being unable to access essential health care, jobs or schooling is continuing to de detrimentally impact many residents and their families. Is the minister aware of any risks to achieving a nationally clear, scientifically sound, fair and reasonable approach to defining hotspots? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, we have seen widely reported examples of hardship for residents Senator in rural and regional border communities. Such impacts should, of course, be minimised whenever possible. Uh, decisions Keneally. on border restrictions must be informed by public health advice. As I said last week, ultimately these are matters for the states and territories. But it is up to them to set out the medical advice, informing their decisions and to ensure there is a genuine public health upside in return for the restrictions and costs imposed Order. on individual Australians and on our communities. There is no script or no rule book on how best to deal with this pandemic, but it is critical that decisions are made order on the basis on my left. of advice. Sorry, Senator Cormann, I have Senator Billick on a point of order. On a point of order, Senator Billick. Uh, Mr President, I really sincerely cannot hear what the minister is saying, even though I might not want to hear it and might not like uh, it, I, and I, 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 from I, that side. Well, I, I can only order. Well, that's a charming episode of finger pointing there across the chamber from both sides, I might say. Um, order, 
interjections. There's, there's a lot of noise coming from the chamber. I was attempting to not interrupt the speaker and call order. Please show your colleagues some courtesy. Senator Cormann. The National Cabinet has asked the IHPPC to develop the consist a consistent approach to hotspot management and, and to ensure that the needs of border residents are pro properly catered for. As the Prime Minister said on Friday, there will be a hotspot definition. Hopefully, it's a definition agreed by the states and territories. Alternatively, there will be a Commonwealth definition based on science and Order, evidence. Senator Cormann. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I acknowledge the Nationals' calls for an agricultural workers' code as a priority and welcome the Prime Minister's announcement at the Bush Summit on progress being made to give effect to this very important initiative. Can the minister please outline the intended protections of an agricultural workers' code and update the Senate on the progress of this work? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the Australian government recognises the challenges that communities and farmers have faced over the past few months as a result of COVID-19 and domestic movement restrictions. On 21 August, the National Cabinet agreed to the development of an agricultural workers' code to be considered at National Cabinet at its next meeting. The Code recognises the importance of ensuring that farmers, seasonal workers, agricultural services such as vets and agricultural business can continue to operate in a COVID-19 safe manner. Uh, the Minister for Agriculture, Water and Environment is leading the development of the Code, which would be enforced by states and territories through, the public health, through their public health orders. The fundamental objective of the Code will be to provide consistency across jurisdictions in the application of movement restrictions, uh, including any national hotspots definition developed, and indeed simple and practical definition of critical primary industries, and set out appropriate measures necessary to manage COVID-19 risks. Order. As always, we we'll focus on protecting people's livelihoods. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Today, the Minister for Health announced additional funding to stop the COVID-19 aged care crisis. Why has it taken the deaths of more than 457 Australians in aged care and seven months of the COVID-19 crisis for the Morrison government to finally provide these additional resources? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the question, Senator Keneally. Um, as I said in the previous question, Minister Hunt and I announced this morning uh, $563 million to extend existing measures that were, um, were supporting the aged care sector. Uh, the, the suggestion that we've waited until now, uh, quite frankly, um, doesn't, doesn't make sense given that these measures, Mr President, were put in place to support the sector. Uh, and what we did this morning, today, was, was we actually extended existing measures to continue the support that we already had in place for an additional six months in most of those cases, Mr. President. So, early in the pandemic, we made some decisions, uh, we resourced those decisions, and we announced the funding to support those. Today, what we did was to extend those provisions, given the fact that we remain in a COVID-19 pandemic. We have particular circumstances with respect to Victoria that require additional support, and the sector nationally remains under pressure. So what we did, Mr President, was we announced an extension to existing programs so that the support required from the, for the sector throughout the pandemic, uh, the support required as part of our plan, could be continued for a further period of time so that, uh, so, so that the sector did have the support required and continues to have the support required as the pandemic continues. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Given the minister admitted he only realised he hadn't got it right as a result of the outbreak at St Basil's in July, six months into the COVID-19 crisis, will he guarantee that the funding announced today by Minister Hunt will be enough to get it right. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, Senator Keneally chooses to misuse my words in a way that I didn't utter them, and it demonstrates the continued dishonesty of the Labor Party in asking questions in this place, Mr. President. Mr. President, the, the announcements that I made today with Minister Hunt are a continuation of existing programs, Mr. President. They're a continuation 
of existing programs and existing support that was put in place to support the sector through the COVID-19 outbreak. And we will continue to provide resources, as I've said, Mr. President, on a number of occasions uh, through the duration of the pandemic outbreak. We will continue to provide additional support as required. We got to a, a stage, Mr. President, where the existing reports were due to expire, supports were due to expire. Uh, we assessed that they needed to be continued, Mr. President. So we made the decision to continue them, and Minister Hunt and I announced them today. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. In October last year, in October last year, the government received the interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, and it was titled "Neglect." Why is the minister continuing to withhold the resources necessary to implement these recommendations from the report titled "Neglect" and prevent further neglect and avoidable deaths in the aged care system? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the government has not withheld support from the sector. Uh, the, announcements, the announcements that we made today, Mr. President, were specifically related to assisting the sector manage their way through COVID-19. But, Mr. President, uh, on the suggestion of the Royal Commission and uh, coming out of the report that was made by the uh, Royal Commission in November last year, there were a number of additional resources supplied to the sector that the Royal Commission suggested. And that included an additional 10,000 home care packages. It included some resources to ensure that medication management and the, and the use of uh, chemical restraints were minimised. It included some funding to ensure that young people going into residential aged care were minimised. So, Mr President, uh, we have continued to put additional resources to the aged care sector. And as the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, and as I've said, we will continue to do that at every opportunity. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please outline how the Morrison government is extending and continuing its support for the aged care sector as part of our plan to assist the sector in responding to community transmission of COVID-19? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thanks, Senator Van, for the question. Mr President, today the government announced a further $563 million in a package of measures to support senior Australians and aged care from COVID-19. These additional targeted measures mean that since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr President, the Australian government has provided over $1.5 billion to support senior Australians in aged care. This includes continuation of measures to support providers and the su support the choice of senior Australians. As part of this package, up to $245 million will be provided for a second payment of the lump sum COVID-19 support payment, Mr. President, to residential aged care providers. Residential providers in, uh, in metropolitan areas will get $975 per resident, and all other providers will receive $1,435. Mr. President. This funding will be used by providers to fund and support enhanced infection control capability, including through an on-site clinical lead, quite importantly. Funding will also, may also be used to address other COVID-19-related costs, such as increased staffing costs, communications with families and managing visitation arrangements. Mr. President, this additional support will, uh, will be provided to all mainstream residential residential aged care providers, also to Indigenous and multi-purpose services. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will be undertaking risk assessments and audits to ensure that providers are prepared for an outbreak. This funding supports providers with this preparedness. Mr. President. In addition to the risk assessments and audits, providers will report in their end of year financial year returns on how the support was used in overcoming additional COVID-19 Order. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Can the minister please outline how the government is continuing to support the aged care workforce at this time? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the package announced today further builds on specific measures that we've announced previously to support the aged care workforce at this time, Mr. President. Continuing the aged care workforce ret uh, retention payment program for eligible frontline 
direct care staff recognising the particular role Order. that they play in looking after our most uh, uh, vulnerable Australians, Mr. President. So this, the, we're extending the bonus for a further period to support direct care workforce and encourage retention at a cost of $154.5 million. In addition, we're supporting aged care providers and workers who may be affected by the single worker, single site principle, Mr. President, in hotspot areas in regions in Victoria with up to $92.4 million in funding. Mr. President, we're also extending this support from an initial eight weeks to 12 weeks in recognition of the prolonged situation in Victoria and to allow providers to claim for a longer period. Uh, Order, this will Senator enable... Colbeck. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the government's further ongoing support for senior Australians in residential aged care who are homeless, seniors at risk of homelessness, and also Indigenous Australians in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Van, for the question. The additional $245 million Mr. President, of funding to the sector includes additional support that will be provided to all mainstream residential aged care, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flex, uh, Flexible Aged Care Program, NATSIFLEX, Indigenous Program and multi-purpose services. This measure also extends the 30 per cent increase in the viability supplement for both residential care and home care and the homeless supplement in residential care by a further six months at a cost of $26 million. The increase in the viability supplement will also assist home care providers uh, and their consumers. Mr. President. In addition, the Australian government has committed an additional $71.4 million to support older, older Australians who temporarily relocate from residential aged care facilities to the community to live with their families as a precaution against COVID-19. Senator Seward. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, through you, President, next month, when there Order. will be 1.8 million people on the job seeker payment and youth allowance, the government will cut the coronavirus supplement by $300 a fortnight. Last week, Treasury predicted the effective unemployment rate will hit 13 per cent by the end of the year. How many people are expected to default on their mortgage and be in rental stress when, firstly, the supplement reduces by $300 a fortnight in September and, secondly, if the job seeker rate goes back to $40 a day in December? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Seward, for your question. Uh, and can I also acknowledge that you announced your uh, retirement at the end of this session, uh, come the end of this parliament, and, uh, and acknowledge the great work that you've done on behalf of the people you represent. Um, in, in response to your, the principal part of your question in relation to changes that are being made to both the, the job seeker and job keeper payments, but particularly the job seeker payment at the end of September, um, Senator, you and as well as everybody else was in this chamber uh, back in March when we made the decision to put in place the coronavirus supplement for a period of six months. It was very clear at the time we were voting for a temporary payment. In July, um, a decision was made by the government that we believe that the time for the removal of that temporary supplement um, was not at the end of September. And so we have sought and through an instrument in this place to extend the elevated level of support to those people who find themselves unemployed past the end of September until uh, December. At the same time, we've also put in place uh, an income, in, uh, increased income-free area because we recognise, Senator Seward, that the jobs market is still very shallow, but it is starting to open up. And we want to encourage people who find themselves unemployed as a result of coronavirus to actually take the steps to start re-engaging with the workforce so that we can hopefully get them re-employed as quickly as possible. And the one thing that we do know <clears throat> Senator Seward, on the point of order. I understand I did a bit of preamble, but we're now down to 30 seconds left in the time to answer the question. The minister's come nowhere near my question, which was how many will be defaulting or in rental stress when the supplement is cut? Okay. Senator Seward, no. I'll say again. Um, when questions contain a preamble, the minister can be directly relevant to part of a question. That was the second part of your question. The minister is being directly relevant to other parts of your question, in my view. Um, Senator Seward, 
administer can be directly relevant to assertions and a preamble to a point made at the end of a, of a longer question that is within standing orders. So I can't direct the minister how to answer a question nor which part of it to answer. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and as I said, Senator Seawitt, um, past the end of September, we are intending to continue to provide elevated levels of support to people who find themselves unemployed, whether they were unemployed before the coronavirus um, hit or as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, because we on this side of the chamber understand we have a responsibility to balance uh, providing the level of elevated support people need, as well as making sure that we provide the incentive for them to re engage with the workforce because the best Order, thing we can Senator do Rustin, is get them back into work. Expired. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to say, thank the minister for her comments about me uh, retiring at the end of my uh, term. Um, I'd just like to reassure the chamber that I'll be here for quite a while to give you the. Uh, hold you to account. The latest research from ANU shows that the coronavirus supplement almost eliminated poverty amongst job seeker recipients and the reduction of the job seeker payment will mean that 740,000 people are pushed into poverty. Minister, how is this conscionable? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I have no doubt that you will continue to hold us to account in the time that you have left here, Senator Seawitt. Um, but um, in relation to your question around the elevated levels of support that were put in place back in March by this government, um, it was clear at the time that we recognised that we had before us an absolutely unprecedented situation. And we put in place these supports to help Australians to get from one side of the coronavirus pandemic to the other. Clearly, as the pandemic has rolled out, we have seen different things happen in different states. But the one thing that we have started to see in the majority of Australia, our economy is starting to open up again and we're starting to see jobs created. It is the responsibility of government, as I said before, to manage the balance between providing elevated levels of support in recognition that people are still doing it quite tough as a result of the coronavirus. Um, coronavirus pandemic, but at the same time, we need to make sure that people understand they need to re-engage with the workforce because getting a job Order, is the Senator best way Rustin. out. Senator C, what a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. President, Minister, at the COVID hearing not long ago, you said that to make any changes to the ongoing structural nature of our welfare system when we're in such a state of uncertainty would be completely irresponsible. How is it irresponsible to guarantee that you won't drop people back into poverty on $40 a day? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, and I, th I think that everybody in this chamber recognises that we are in quite unprecedented times and we are still in them. There is absolutely no doubt that the end of this corona pande coronavirus pandemic, when it's going to end and what it's going to look like when it ends, is still remains something that we are unsure of. So therefore, the government has remained flexible and to make sure that the temporary nature of the, the provisions that we put in place recognise the constantly changing conditions that this pandemic is presenting to the Australian economy. You only have to look in Victoria to realise that there we have a particular set of circumstances down there, uh, and we've seen the announcements today in aged care, to directly deal with those particular instances. But what we have to do as a government is that we have to manage our way through this pandemic, putting in place the provisions that are required at the time. And when we get to a situation where we understand what the new normal looks like, that is the time to make structural change. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Uh, on the 27th of February, uh, Sport Australia told the Select Committee on the Administration of Sports Grants it would provide the legal advice um, underpinning former Minister Mackenzie's authority to make decisions in the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants program. But last week, the Sports Australia uh, informed the Select Committee it would not provide the advice as the Minister for Sport had made a claim of public interest immunity. When did the Minister make that decision and on what basis does he make the claim of public interest immunity? Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the uh, decision to make uh, a public Im interest immunity uh, exemption was made some time ago, Mr. President. And, uh, Mr. President, on behalf of the government, I claimed public interest immunity in relation to Support Australia's 
legal advice, as the release of this advice could prejudice uh, pending legal proceedings. Mr. President. Uh, additionally, it's been the long-standing practice of Australian governments over many decades on both sides of politics, Mr. President, to uh, not to disclose the fact or content of privileged legal advice. This practice has previously uh, been outlined by uh, many colleagues in the chamber, uh, including the Honourable Gareth Evans QC, uh, who said, or, nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over many years for any government to make legal, available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of normal decision-making process of government. For good practical reasons associated with good government and also as a matter of fundamental principle, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, in my view, my claim of public interest immunity was based on good and sound grounds, uh, long standing a practice on governments, of governments from both persuasions of politics. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, the government maintains that it is not in the public interest to depart from this established position. It is integral that privileged legal Senator advice provided to the Commonwealth remains confidential. Order. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question? Yes, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, in March, the minister admitted he had been coached by Mr Morrison's staff before appearing to give evidence uh, on the sports rort scandal. Has the minister or his office discussed the public interest immunity claim with Mr Morrison or his office? And if so, why? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Firstly, can I reject the assertion about any activity or conversation between uh, my office, me, and the Prime Minister's office? Yeah. Mr. President. So I, 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 reject, I reject the assertion Order. of being coached. And again, Mr. President, Labor continue to make things up, Mr. President. And that's just because Labor says it doesn't make it so, Mr President. Yes, I had a meeting with the Prime Minister's office, uh, but it wasn't about coaching, Mr President. Mr President, uh, I, made, on my I made the decision on to my... claim public immunity, Mr President. Order. I made... Order on my left. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I can't hear you due to the interjections. Please continue. Mr President, I made the decision to claim public, public inter, interest immunity based on well-founded grounds and historical, historical context of, uh, de, of decision makers in this parliament over a Order, considerable Senator period Colbert, of time. time for the answers expired. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do have another question. Thank you, Mr uh, President. Uh, why is the minister refusing to explain to Australians the basis upon which the government claims that former Minister Mackenzie had authority to make decisions under the sports rorts scheme. Uh, what is he hiding? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, as I've said in the two former questions, uh, I claimed public interest immunity over legal advice on long-standing grounds that have been applied by governments of both political persuasions over a considerable period of time. Uh, and I believe, Mr President, uh, that I had good grounds to do that and I made the public interest Im immunity question uh, decision appropriately. We're going to Senator Roberts remotely. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Senator Cormann. In 2016, 17, 19, and 20, I cross examined CSIRO's climate research team on four presentations to me. That revealed CSIRO has never said carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. CSIRO admitted today's Order. temperatures are not unprecedented. Order. Sorry, um, I've asked repeatedly last week for interjections to not occur, and they came from both sides of the chamber, and I might say they, com they commenced on the opposition side. They should not have been responded to from the government side. Senator Roberts, I'm, go I'm going to ask for stone silence in the chamber, and I'm going to ask Senator Roberts to repeat his question so that the minister may hear it and address it. Senator Roberts, can you please recommence your question? From the start, Mr President? Yes, from the start. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In 2016, 17, 19 and 20, I cross-examined CSIRO's climate research team on four presentations to me. 
That revealed CSIRO has never said carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. CSIRO admitted today's temperatures are not unprecedented. CSIRO's cited papers do not show rate of temperature rain rise is unprecedented. CSIRO has never quantified any specific impact from human carbon dioxide. CSIRO relies on unvalidated erroneous models. CSIRO relied on discredited papers. CSIRO showed little understanding of papers cited. CSIRO admits to no due diligence on reports and data. CSIRO allows politicians to misrepresent CSIRO without correction. 15 highly respected international scientists verified our conclusions. What is the basis for the government's climate and energy policies? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, the basis uh, of our commitment is, uh, as, as part of the international community, doing our bit to help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's the basis. We are committed uh, to a sensible uh, climate change policy which uh, appropriately balances environmental protection uh, with um, economic responsibility. That has always been our position. Uh, and uh, as a country, uh, we uh, have not only met, but we, are, we have exceeded or are exceeding our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Kyoto, and, and we are on track and have a plan uh, to meet our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Paris. I mean, we are a good global citizen. Uh, there is a global challenge that uh, needs to be addressed, and we are doing our bit sensibly and responsibly and proportionately uh, to contribute uh, to meeting that challenge. In relation to the CSIRO specifically, uh, the CSIRO is a national treasure. It undertakes essential science and research which improves our lives and helps grow our economy. CSIRO stands behind its researchers and the integrity of the research produced by them. Uh, they have demonstrated uh, record, their demonstrated record of scientific excellence is underpinned by their commitment to the full and transparent participation uh, in the scientific peer review process which results in evidence-based science of the highest quality, including making data publicly available. Uh, CSIRO is in the top 0.1% of the world for its four core fields of science and in the world's top 1% for the other 14 fields. They rank in the top three of the world, uh, world's national science agencies for impact. And I note that uh, the CSIRO has provided briefings to Senator Roberts uh, in the past, and I also note that Senator Roberts has asked a number of questions which CSIRO has responded to and will, of course, continue to respond to uh, moving forward. Um, I hope that that appropriately addresses uh, Senator Roberts' question. I, I thank senators for their courtesy during Senator Roberts' question, and I ask for it again. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Your ministers for climate and energy and preceding Liberal Nationals and Labor Greens governments claim that climate and renewable energy policies are based on CSIRO advice. Yet CSIRO's climate team admitted to me that CSIRO has never stated carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger, and when asked for the source of that political claim, suggested I ask politicians and ministers. On what basis is your government claiming we need to cut the carbon dioxide from farming, industry, transport and driving cars? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, there is a uh, recognised global challenge which uh, we believe needs to be uh, appropriately addressed uh, in a global fashion through an appropriately uh, comprehensive global arrangement. And Australia, as a responsible uh, international citizen, uh, is committed to doing its bit, and that is precisely what our government is doing. Under our government, uh, emissions are coming down. And electricity prices are also coming down. And you know, we, are, we are keeping the lights on, bringing electricity prices down, and helping to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions in a way that is uh, economically responsible. Uh, and we are very proud uh, of our record, and we, we remain committed to that as the appropriate way forward. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The CSIRO climate research team's position ultimately relies on unvalidated and erroneous computer models that are not suitable as a basis for policy, in implying, falsely, that they have confidence in the models, yet have never assigned a quantitative calculated confidence level, CSIRO has misled you. Will your government hold an independent inquiry into the so-called science that is supposedly the basis of your climate and energy policies? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I think I've clearly stated uh, the basis for the government's uh, decision-making in relation to these areas. And I might just say again that as Australians, we are rightly proud of the CSIRO. The CSIRO uh, is a world-class organisation. Now, that doesn't mean that every bit of research uh, is uh, you know, immediately uh, right on the mark. 
But the CSIRO, like any scientific uh, organization, understands that any research has to be appropriately tested and peer reviewed, uh, and they are absolutely committed to the appropriate uh, rigors and transparencies uh, that apply uh, to any scientific organizations of this nature, and that is, of course, appropriate. So we, we, uh, completely and we completely support the important work the CSIRO does and, and continue to stand by it. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is investing in mental health support for Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the very important question. And of course, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, mental health has been a challenge not just in Australia, but around the world. The Morrison government recognises that the ongoing restrictions in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 are having a significant impact on the mental health of Australians, but in particular, as Sarah Henderson well knows, or Senator Henderson well knows, in particular in communities in Victoria, who continue to be subject to severe lockdown measures. Mr President, since March of this year, the government has announced a number of emergency response measures to support the mental health and well-being of Australians through COVID-19. Access to telehealth services under the Medical Benefits Scheme has been expanded to include mental health, allied health professions and general practice. From 16 March to 16 August 2020, over 5.4 million medical benefits scheduled subsidised mental health services were accessed with 35.1 per cent of mental health services delivered by telehealth. We're also investing in our frontline mental health services through our $74 million COVID-19 mental health support package, with $3 million for a dedicated mental health and wellbeing program for frontline workers, $10 million in funding to support older Australians through a community visitor scheme. $6.8 million for the expansion of Headspace Digital Work and Study Service, $10 million to establish the Coronavirus Wellbeing and Support Line, and $14 million to bolster the capacity of mental health providers such as Lifeline and Beyond Blue. We also have a $48 million National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What additional assistance is the government providing to Victoria as second stage lockdowns force Australians back into isolation, potentially cutting them off from family and social supports? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as Senator Henderson has said, uh, Victorians, in some part, they're doing it really tough, and the government understands the severe nature of the COVID-19 restrictions in parts of Victoria. And uh, we have therefore provided additional assistance to Victorians at this time. We've including the doubling of funding for the Better Access Plan to increase access to mental health practitioners through Medicare. For support for young people through youth support, there is $12 million for service surge capacity to Victorians, including $5 million for Headspace, with a particular focus on those in year 11 and year 12. Across all of Victoria, we are funding an additional 10 Medicare-subsidised psychological therapy sessions for people who are affected by the further restrictions or who are in quarantine or required to self-isolate and have already used the 10 existing sessions that they have. We're also establishing 15 dedicated mental health clinics across Victoria, and our Senator McKenzie Order, will place no six are in rural and regional has expired. areas. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, what is the government's understanding of the impacts that additional lockdowns are having on Victorians, and where can people access support services if they need it? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the government is closely monitoring mental health service usage to respond quickly and lessen the mental health impacts of COVID-19 and the recovery phase. In the past four weeks, Victorian access to support services was 90 per cent higher than the rest of the country for Beyond Blue, 22 per cent higher for Lifeline and 5 per cent higher for the Kids Helpline. We're also, though, in light of this, uh, in conjunction with the Victorian government, we have agreed to establish a new Victorian mental health task force 
to ensure the latest initiatives are implemented as quickly as possible. And this is important additional assistance, of course, for Victorians at this time. In terms of the Beyond Blue Coronavirus World Bank support service, it's available to all Australians needing support through the COVID-19 pandemic and can be accessed via telephone or online. And uh, through Order, these services, Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Today, Minister Hunt announced $92.4 million in funding to prevent aged care workers from working at multiple facilities. Will the minister guarantee that aged care workers will no longer work at multiple facilities? If not, why not? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today, Minister Hunt and I announced a number of measures to support the aged care sector to um, manage the COVID-19 outbreak. One of those measures, Mr. President, was to support a negotiated agreement between the aged care sector and the unions in Victoria to uh, ensure that one worker could work at one site, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, that agreement is not inclusive of the entire aged care sector. And of course, Mr. President, there are some workers who we do require to work across more than one site. Mr. President, so includes our ADF nurses who go into a number of facilities to provide assistance to the aged care sector when our facility is under stress. It also includes, Mr. President, our OSMAT teams that go in to provide assistance to aged care facilities when they're under stress. It also includes uh, the Sonic and uh, Aspen testing teams that are required to go in to do the testing for providers, Mr. President, uh, and it doesn't include. Uh, as a part of that program, agency nurses who are required for surge workforce capacity across the aged care sector in Victoria. So it supports workers who are employed normally by aged care providers to work in one facility. And the, the point of the program and the support that we're providing is to ensure that workers aren't work worth worse off by the fact that they are uh, asked to work across one site. So, Mr. President, this is a continuation of that, pro of that process, and the announcement that I made with Minister Hunt this morning extends the period of that program from eight weeks to 12, to 12 weeks, acknowledging the ongoing circumstances of the pandemic in Victoria. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that the A Matter of Care, Australia's aged care workforce strategy delivered to his government two years ago, recommended a national database of workers? Why has the Morrison government ducked the report and sat on it instead of taking action that would have better prepared its aged care system for the COVID pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. In, uh, contrary to uh, the question from Senator McCarthy, the government is actually ac actioning that particular proposal right now. Uh, com the consultation process Order. has completed uh, and we are working with the sector to provide a national workforce identification and registration process uh, and incorporating into that process uh, uh, qualification requirements that might be required for providers uh, f that providers would need for their workforce across the sector. So, Mr President, it's not true to say that we're not actioning that uh, recommendation. We, in fact, are. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why has it taken more than 1,800 cases of COVID-19 in aged care, the deaths of 457 older Australians in aged care, and seven months for the Morrison government to finally provide support for aged care workers? Senator Colbeck. Again, Mr. President, I have to say that I can't agree with the premise of the question put by Senator McCarthy, because we've been providing support to workers for in aged care since March, Mr. President, since early in the aged care pandemic, Mr. President. So maybe, Order maybe, on my left. maybe Labor are a bit Order. concerned that they are so late to the party on, the, on, on this issue that they've only discovered aged care in recent weeks, Mr. Order. President. But we have been working with the aged care sector in this country since January to, to assist them and to prepare them for COVID-19, Mr. President. Uh, so we've been, we, we've been working and providing advice and support to this sector on COVID-19 since January, and the measures that Mr. Minister Hunt and I announced today were in fact a continuation of existing measures that we'd put in place previously in recognition of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic continues. 
Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister advise the Senate of the defence outcomes from the recent OSMIN meetings with her US counterpart? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McMahon for the question and also for her unwavering support for the ADF right across the Northern Territory. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, the United States and Australia are experiencing profound changes in our geostrategic circumstances. So now, more than ever, we must place a premium on ensuring our alliance continues to serve both our nation's interests. At Osmin this year, the Foreign Minister and I did just that. We delivered outcomes to ensure the alliance is best placed to respond to these challenges. At Osmin, Secretary Esper and I agreed to three new defence outcomes. These build on our substantial engagements over the past year. Firstly, we signed a statement of principles on alliance defence cooperation and force posture priorities in the Indo-Pacific. This builds on our force posture cooperation over the past decade, and it will drive the next decade of our cooperation. Secondly, Mr. President, we announced our intent to develop a US-funded, commercially operated strategic military fuel reserve in the Territory. This is a significant step in strengthening our supply chain resilience. Thirdly, we agreed to further deepen our defence science and technology cooperation. This includes hypersonics, electronic warfare and also in space-based capabilities. This will ensure the Alliance maintains our capability edge. Colleagues, our alliance is in great shape, but we can never, ever take it for granted. Both nations share a vision for a region that is secure and that is prosperous, one in which the sovereign interests of all states, large and small, are respected. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on the initiatives to deepen defence cooperation in the Indo-Pacific? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator McMahon. At Osmin, we agreed to deepen regional cooperation. Our forced posture cooperation is a tangible demonstration of our shared interests and our mutual deep engagement in our region. The Statement of Principles re-established a working group to develop recommendations to advance cooperation, both in Australia and also in our shared region. A modified marine rotational force in Darwin has proceeded this year, and it's gone very smoothly, despite the challenges of COVID-19. This is truly a testament to the adaptability and also to the strength of our alliance. We continue to strengthen our shared ability to contribute to regional stability. Our alliance remains a major force for stability and security in our region. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the defence industry outcomes secured during Osmin, and how this will support Australian workers and help drive the road to economic recovery? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator McMahon, for the question. And I particularly thank you for your support for defence industry in the Northern Territory. Mr. President, a key priority was to secure new outcomes for Australian industry and also for Australian workers, outcomes that build on the 15,000 Australian businesses and 70,000 Australian workers already benefiting from our investment in defence. At Osmin, we agreed to reduce barriers to industrial base integration, including Australian participation in US supply chains. And there is no better example of this than the 50 Australian companies that are already contributing to the global F-35 program. On this side of the chamber, we are committed to further developing our bilateral defence trade and to working together on export controls. Greater maintenance, re greater maintenance repairs and overhaul of US platforms in Australia will mutually strengthen our capabilities Order, and also Reynolds. our resilience. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Tragically, more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19, and there are now more than 951 active cases in residential. Order. We're talking about 951 active 
Thank you. Order, Senator Henderson. I'd like to hear Would you Senator like to Wong's stand up question. And defend him? Order, Senator Wong. Please ignore I'd the interjection. Like I've called Senator Henderson to order. Please Tragically, continue. I might start again if I may, Mr. President. As, as leader, I'll give you that. Thank you. Senator Tragically, Wong. more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19, and there are now more than 951 active cases in residential aged care. A 77-year-old St Basil's resident who did not contract COVID-19 died after suffering dehydration and malnutrition, which accelerated her dementia and led to her death. Doctors have described her situation as a case of neglect. How many Australians have died in aged care this year, not as a, as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of neglect? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, it is quite tragic that Labor seek to try and play politics with the Order. passing of Order. senior Australians in, uh, in residential aged care, Mr, Mr. President. And Order. And, Mr President, um, there are about 60,000 Australians who die in residential aged care on an annual basis, uh, unfortunately, but uh, that's one of the functions of residential aged care. Uh, I don't have statistics on Order. Mr President, Mr. President uh, and, and the, the objective of the Australian aged care system is to provide all residents in residential aged care with a high quality of care uh, uh, across the nation. That is, the, that is the, the focus and the purpose of our residential aged care system and the regulatory framework that supports order. it, Mr Senator President. But as we Sen know, Senator Colbeck, have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Direct relevance. I ask this minister how many Australians have died as a consequence of neglect in the context, particularly, if I may say, of a report entitled Neglect handed down by His Royal Commission. If he's not able to answer the question, could he take it on notice? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. Um, in my view, if he is talking about people passing away in aged care, um, he doesn't have to adopt the terminology or the assumption of the question, but he does have to limit himself to that particular topic to be directly relevant. I think he is at the moment, but I will listen carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, Mr President, uh, we all acknowledge that there are things that need to be improved about the aged care sector in this country. That's why we're having a Royal Commission, Mr President. That's why one of the first acts of this Prime Minister, Pr Prime Minister Morrison, Order. was to call a Royal Commission, Mr President. And I've heard Labor MPs trotting around this place over the last few days, claiming that they supported it when they didn't, Mr. President. Order. Including then leader order. Mr. Senator Short. Colbeck on a point of order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order. Direct relevance. How many Australians have died in aged care this year as a result of neglect? It is a reasonable question. I'd ask the minister to return Senator, to it. Senator Cormann on the point of order. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think that what uh, Senator Colbeck was explaining uh, is that it's not actually a black and white question to why Senator Wong is seeking to frame it, and he was making precisely that point. He was, he was addressing very directly uh, the fact he was, very, he was addressing very directly that uh, this is not a question that can be answered in the way that uh, you know, Senator Wong is seeking to do for political reasons. On the, on, the, on the point of order, order, on the point of order, I'm not Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, dismissing a question that goes to facts as not being relevant because it's politics is really not uh, is not so consistent with the standing. Uh, I'm not. The, the motive of a particular question uh, is not for me to make an observation on. There are times to debate it. Um, Senator Wong, I would normally have pulled the minister up on the royal commission issue, but you did raise it in your previous point of order, so I was giving him some um, discretion to deal with that point that was raised. Um, as I've said before, I think if the minister is confining his answer to the passing away of people in aged care, then he is being directly relevant. And I'm listening carefully, and he seems to be. So I'll call on the minister to continue. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So across, across the country, as I said earlier, Mr President, there are about 60,000 people who pass away in residential aged care on an annual basis. Uh, the, the whole purpose of our system, Mr President, is to provide a, a system that is supportive, uh, that provides a high quality of care, uh, and uh, this government 
clearly has an ambition to improve that quality of care. That's why we're undertaking the process that we're currently undertaking. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The former Minister for Sport, Senator McKenzie, resigned as a result of the sports royal scandal. This minister has ignored the interim report of the Royal Commission entitled Neglect, the warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, the warnings from experts and unions, the warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and New March House in April, and more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19. Minister, why haven't you resigned? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the government since January has worked closely with the aged care sector, firstly on preparedness, Mr. President. Uh, and then we have resourced the sector in that preparedness, and we've continued to provide oversight of the sector to ensure that a they are prepared, but also if they're not, there's additional measures that are put in place, Mr. Order. President. Order, Mr. President, and and that's what this government will continue to do, Mr. President. The Labor Party can play its political gotcha games all it likes, but what we will continue Order. to do is exactly Order. what we have done today, announcing left. additional resources and measures to support the sector uh, as it works its way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Under Prime Minister Howard, when one person died connected to the kerosene bath scandal, former Minister Bronwyn Bishop lost her job. Under this minister, aged care residents are so neglected, one had ants crawling from open wounds and residents are dying of neglect. Why doesn't this minister resign? Why doesn't he allow someone like former Shadow Minister for Mental Health and Ageing and senior senator from New South Wales, Fearavanti Wells, to replace him? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. What I will continue to do and what the government will continue to do is to follow the medical advice to provide uh, the systems and the resources that are available to the aged care sector so that they can, they can manage the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that uh, senior Australians get the care that they deserve. That's what we've done in Victoria by, by partnering Order. with the Victorian government to establish the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, and that's what we've done today by the announcements that I've made, along with the minister, to ensure uh, that the sector has Order. the resources that it needs. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Motions to take note of answers, Senator Callagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, questions from Labor senators to Minister Colbeck today in question time. Well, today in question time, we had the full display of the inadequate performance of this government and this minister on aged care. 457 older Australians have passed away, with more than 400 of those in the last six weeks alone. Thousands of residents of aged care have contracted the virus. Hundreds have been evacuated uh, from their homes, often dehydrated, malnourished and soiled. The system is so fragile that the Defence Forces had to be called in to help provide basic care to older Australians because the system couldn't do it without their help. The criticism we have of this government and this minister is not that they didn't stop COVID-19, but our criticism is, and the questions we asked today to hold this minister account, where they failed to plan properly, and once COVID-19 got into aged care facilities, they failed to prevent the spread. They knew older Australians were particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. They knew the aged care system and the residential aged care system were, was broken. They knew the workforce was fragile, it's casualised, and workers work across multiple sites. They knew community transmission was rising in June, and yet it took until late July for the Commonwealth to pull together the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. They knew that personal and clinical care would be one of the first areas where care impacted for residents. They knew PPE was short. They knew back in May when 1,350 aged care providers requested PPE from the government. That was back in May. Surely that would have set off an alarm bell that maybe the sector wasn't as prepared as they had thought it was. And today, 
Earlier today, we found out that there are 33 more older Australians who had resided in residential aged care who had passed away and the Commonwealth didn't even know. The government that funds and regulates a system of care for older Australians in this country didn't even know. Can you imagine that happening in any other system where care is provided? Can you imagine it happening in the childcare system where you just wouldn't know what was happening to the, the children that were using your services? It would seem to me that tracking the number of people who had passed away from COVID-19 in the middle of the worst pandemic in 100 years would be a pretty basic and fundamental element of any pandemic planning exercise. Right from the get-go, I would have assumed that the government that regulates and funds the sector would have wanted to know some basic information, like how many people were contracting the virus, how many people were passing away from it. But it seems that it wasn't until August they put in place a system to audit that. You know, six months in, they start thinking, oh, actually, we better make sure that some of these numbers of people who have passed away actually um, add up. This minister's failure in his portfolio of aged care is real. It's a failure to lead, a failure to reform, a failure to prepare, a failure to protect, a failure to plan. But most of all, it's a failure to properly care for vulnerable Australians who deserved better. Now, we hear a lot from the minister in question time of the government trying to play catch up. They were trying to spin their way out. We've got more money going here and more money going there, but the facts won't change. The minister knew the sector was vulnerable since he took on this job in May last year. I have no doubt that his incoming brief provided him with information that said this sector is vulnerable. Not only is it caring for vulnerable Australians, but there's a whole range of issues about how the system runs that makes it vulnerable. And then there was the Royal Commission called. Surely that would have set off alarms in the minister's head. He gets reports from his department. He knows, and that is our issue today, and that is our issue with his performance. Is he knew in May last year, he knew how vulnerable it was. The reports from the Northern Hemisphere were shocking. And yet we see them playing catch up today, six months in, and nearly 500 people have paid the price for that failure you, to Senator plan Gallagher, and protect. Your time has expired, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Deputy uh, President. Um, <clears throat> the, the government's absolute priority here in this space is to protect the safety of residents and to provide uh, quality care to those in aged care facilities. It should be uh, a priority of all uh, Australian governments uh, to do that. And of, and of course, we express deep sympathy for those who have lost loved ones through this terrible pandemic, uh, and those that are, have had to live with a fallout of a, of a terrible outcome that has occurred, and particularly centred around Victoria, but not only, only uh, there through the last few months. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge too, up front, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is right, it is right and proper that the opposition come into this place and ask us questions on these issues. Uh, uh, there has been. Uh, uh, ter terrible outcomes uh, for Australians uh, through the pandemic, and it's right that we convene Parliament to allow uh, the opposition to hold the government to account on these issues, to ask questions on behalf of uh, particularly those affected families and residents, uh, and to get answers, to get answers uh, from the government on those things. And, and Minister Colbeck, uh, I think uh, over the last week now, has almost ta taken every question, almost every question from the opposition over that week, and the government is open and transparent about what it is doing, what it has done, and where it has gone wrong as well. And we do acknowledge things have gone wrong from time to time. We would prefer things to have gone uh, better than they have. But of course, uh, this, uh, this pandemic, the coronavirus, has overwhelmed uh, uh, many governments uh, uh, and many plans that were in place. The plan that was put in place for the aged care, centre, aged care facilities back uh, in January uh, uh, has had to have been updated and renewed, given the special circumstances of this pandemic. Now, while well, I acknowledge, the, I acknowledge the, uh, the correctness of the opposition bringing questions in this place uh, on this issue, they would have the opposition would have a lot more credibility, a lot more credibility, if they held the same account, the same 
uh, uh, accountability to the Victorian Labor government, as they're seeking to do here uh, in this place. Calls for people to resign this place aren't, uh, aren't echoed uh, for errors and missteps that have occurred in Victoria, which may I say seem on a much, much larger scale and indeed are the origins of all of these problems. Uh, come from the deficiencies of the Victorian government. We still saw yesterday. We saw the bizarre, uh, bizarre situation yesterday of Mr. Albanese, the leader of the opposition, uh, calling for uh, uh, coalition ministers to resign, but at the same time continuing to defend the disastrous decisions of the Andrews government. Uh, disastrous, given as the Daily Telegraph puts it today, Albo's blind spot on Dan uh, puts it nice and succinctly. Uh, uh, the Daily Telegraph points out. Uh, that, that yesterday on the ABC, Mr Albanese was defending, defending the Victorian government's shocking record on tracking and tracing, not just the hotel quarantine system, that's a whole other story, but, but on, the, on the tracking and tracing system in Victoria, which has clearly not been up to scratch. But, but Mr. Albanese, Mr Albanese is running a protection racket for the Labor Party, not a proper accountability mechanism for all Australian governments. Uh, if only, if only, Madam Acting President, the, uh, the Victorian Parliament could, could hold their government, the Victorian people could hold their government to as, to as much as an account as what is occurring here in Canberra. We have convened the federal parliament. We've brought people all around the country with different quarantine arrangements, uh, uh, different border restrictions, but we've made it work because it's right and proper to have the parliament here uh, to answer these questions. Yet the Victorian parliament refuses to sit, or the Victorian government refuses to allow the Victorian Parliament to sit to some sort of modern day King Charles, uh, uh, the, the Victorian Premier is saying no, he's not allowing the Parliament to sit. And just like King Charles, the only way he's going to reconvene Parliament is to give himself more executive powers uh, so that he doesn't have to have Parliament back again. In fact, I had a look at it last week, Madam Deputy President. The Victorian Parliament, by my calculations, has sat, has sat uh, for roughly for I think seven days in the last five months, around 150 days since. The coronavirus took off and, and necessarily took, caused some disruption to parliamentary sittings. But it, it, despite parliaments all around Australia, all around the world, finding a way to sit, finding a way to do things remotely uh, through this uh, new and modern world, uh, uh, the Victorian government continues to hide from the people, continues to hide from accountability, and the Labor Party here federally are complicit in providing uh, that protection. Now, I won't have time, Madam Deputy President, to talk a little bit more, which I would have loved to about some of the things that we are doing to, to fix the situation in Victoria. My colleague Senator Rennick might take some of that up, but we are making sure we provide substantial assistance to the aged care sector to help with increased staffing, uh, to deal with the issues of course, of having to displace staff when, a, when an outbreak occurs in a, in a facility, and to provide the defence force where possible. And We will continue to do that because our focus remains on providing adequate quick care uh, to those in this Thank terrible you, situation. Senator Canavan, your time has expired. Senator Carr. Yes, uh, Madam Deputy President, the question time today highlighted the fact that the minister was now acknowledging the tragic deaths of some 457 uh, people in our aged care facilities across the country. And what was particularly remarkable was that he said that there were 33 people that he didn't know uh, about as the minister, and this had to be reported. And uh, as a consequence, that uh, was, uh, I find, uh, quite an extraordinary proposition, particularly in the case where we're talking about uh, Victoria, where I found out, uh, I've checked today, uh, my uh, advice is that uh, of uh, those uh, 420 Victorians in aged care facilities have passed away during this crisis. Um, those uh, figures the minister suggested needed further work. The Victorian Age Response Centre and the, uh, had to clearly needed to do further work to reconcile the figures. He said so. The 420, the numbers that the Victorians are using today, uh, stands in contrast to the 457 that the Commonwealth is still using. What's particularly of concern to me is that the deaths that have occurred, the tragic deaths that have occurred, have entirely been within Commonwealth managed facilities entirely. There's been not one death in a Victorian government run facility. Not one death. So all of these facilities have been in centres that you would have thought the Commonwealth would have had a direct line of advice on. Now of course the Victorian government publicly government run facilities, the public facilities, and unlike the private ones, are 
man have mandated minimum staffing requirements. And so the question arises around quality, the question arises around the deregulation of private facilities, which I think is at the core of much of the quality issues doesn't arise. Now we know that many groups, public, private, not for profit, play a role in providing care for our aged Australians. But what is absolutely critical is that it's the Commonwealth Government that has overall responsibility, a proposition that the Prime Minister has acknowledged uh, on many occasions. What, within that context, is a simple proposition that has set up a Royal Commission and has then sought to ignore that Royal Commission and the advice that that Royal Commission has provided to him in terms of its interim report, and as recently as the 24th of August, where the Royal Commissioners have said that currently the Australian Government has no care quality outcome reporting for its home care and reports are only on a three indicators for its residential care. And had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would not have known much earlier and have suffered for many people would have been avoided. And of course, Senator Ferrari Verdi Welch has been referred to today by Senator Wong in her question, made it very clear in her submission to the Royal Commission that the aged care sector is on the brink of collapse. And I quote again, there needs to be a clear direction for the government to stop tinkering on the edges to undertake real structure reform. The coalition had promised real reform of the sector and regrettably instead had become a merry-go-round of ministers with a lack of stability, inertia and a de demonstrated by the aged care sector design and its operation. So by any standards, this minister and the previous uh, government's uh, arrangements, that is conservative government's arrangements, should have resigned. But it's not just this minister that should be held in uh, terms of his responsibilities here. The question of the role of the health minister himself comes into question. He's the senior cabinet minister. He's the minister for, responsible for responsibility at the cabinet table. And why has he left these vital tasks to the junior minister when there have been so many warning signs, so many examples of the failure, the neglect, the administrative neglect of this system to the point where they don't even know how many people have died as a result of their failures. At every level, the Prime Minister, who's tried to dodge this issue, cut funding, pretend it's someone else's problem, as we heard yet again here today, try to blame somebody else, the Health Minister, the Junior Minister. This is a government that has resided over a tragedy, a shocking tragedy. This is a government that should front up to its responsibilities and should acknowledge that there Thank needs you, to be Senator fundamental Carr, change in this approach. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think it's time we had a look at the facts, uh, because it turns out, you see, that on the weekend, uh, Victoria's Chief Medical Officer, Brett Sutton, admitted that people dying with COVID are being counted as people dying from COVID, particularly those in aged care and palliative care. And I quote, anyone who is a confirmed case who dies is classified amongst co coronavirus deaths, so it doesn't have to be definitely from coronavirus. And in some instances, you know, in aged care, there would have been some residents who are already receiving palliative care who became infected with coronavirus. So um, it's not definite about whether or not they've died with or from coronavirus. And I have to say that upon seeing the video, I was quite shocked by this because I would have thought governments would have a duty of care to properly disclose the number of deaths from COVID. You know, why are people already in palliative care being counted as a COVID death? And more to the point, why isn't the Victorian Labor government telling the truth? It's a total abuse of power to curtail people's liberties without proper disclosure. And what about those opposite us? Are they going to apologise to the minister for the slurs in the pylon in this chamber, in particular inferring that these deaths were avoidable when in some cases it appears that they weren't? And instead of asking Minister Colbeck to resign, why don't they demand Daniel Andrews or the Premier Victoria to resign? He was the one who failed to contain community transmission. He was the one who didn't have enough contact traces, unlike New South Wales, who was much better prepared. 
the Andrews Labor government failed to have enough contact tracers. Even worse, he was the one who pulled staff from St Basil's with only a day's notice, leaving the federal government to come in and clean up the mess. I mean, wouldn't you make sure you had appropriate staffing in place before leaving these residents to fend for themselves? Or wouldn't you get the residents into hospitals so they could be cared for? The whole point of the lockdown in March was so that state governments could get their health systems up to speed to deal with COVID. So can someone tell me that some state governments, in particular Victoria and Queensland, are using the police force and not the health system to deal with COVID? Because you can't help the weak by tearing down the strong. You don't lock down the economy indefinitely without an exit plan. The state premiers need to lay out an exit plan. The fact is there have been minimal cases of COVID in all states except Victoria. But I can tell you what is out there, and we're not getting much information on this, and it's interesting. I know that uh, those opposite us have been attacking uh, Minister Colbeck for not having information to hand. Well, I've been chasing up information for the last five months now as to uh, the number of people dying from su suicide, depression, uh, homelessness and things like that. And a lot of that, most of that uh, information comes from state governments and a, a lot of it hasn't been forthcoming. And I find it very frustra frustrating every day to listen to these uh, press conferences by state premiers rattling off uh, numbers to do with COVID, but they seem to ignore every other health impact or every, every other uh, uh, impact on society um, that's also going on. I mean, it's about time state premiers started to look at the overall picture and not just uh, looked at COVID, uh, because in my view, some of this stuff's to actually try and divert attention from uh, what I'd have to say has been poor mismanagement of the health system, in particular in Queensland. Now, I'll quote you some numbers on Queensland. There are now 2,774 patients waiting longer than is safe for surgery. Now, I should add that a lot of those patients were waiting pre-COVID because the Labor Party in Queensland has destroyed our health system. The, the queue of Queenslanders forced to wait longer than the clinically recommended time for surgery is now 20 times longer than it was before the pandemic. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia came out two weeks ago and said the border closures were creating a second healthcare crisis. Well, that didn't turn out to be an understatement, did it? We've now seen the death of a baby thanks to Anna Palaszczuk's confusing border laws that led to the delay in the mother and the baby getting adequate medical attention. I've seen the Queensland Labor Party do some pretty low things over the years, introduce poker machines, close over 30 maternity wards in the regions, record waiting lists for surgery, ambulance ramping and record crime rates. But I don't think I've seen Thank anything you, as callous Rennick. as what Anna Palaszczuk has, has done. Expired. And I do remind you once again, it is a broad ranging uh, discussion and you were mostly on topic, which was to take note of answers um, from Senator Colbeck. So I'd ask you to bear that in mind in future. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 457 aged care residents have died. 457. Older Australians with families, friends, children and grandchildren, and there are loved ones who are grieving. What is happening in our aged care homes is a national tragedy, a national disgrace. And the Morrison government has no plan to address the crisis in aged care. The Morrison government needs to fix the home care crisis now. And the reality of this government's aged care mess means the waiting time to receive high-level care at home is almost three years. And at the front line of this crisis are the workers. They deserve to know, when they show up for a shift, that there will be adequate protective equipment for them. They shouldn't have to choose which hand to put a glove on. And they deserve training in infection control for their protection and the protection of those they care for. And yet, as the Herald Sun today reported, federal aged care authorities are in the dark over whether staff are working at more than one home. This is despite a report two years ago 
recommending a national database of workers. A matter of care, Australia's aged care workforce strategy delivered to this government two years ago recommended a national database of workers. Such a database would help aged care authorities monitor if aged care workers are working at more than one home. And during a pandemic, this is invaluable information. Many aged care workers work at multiple aged care facilities and, unfortunately, have spread the virus. They felt they could not call in sick if they felt unwell, and in fact some were told they must come to work even if they were sick. This is a broken system, and it's this government that has sat on that report instead of taking action. It's so clear the warnings were there, and there are still no answers from Senator Colbeck. The Royal Commission's interim report into aged care quality and safety entitled Neglect was tabled on 31 October 2020. 31 October. That report found the aged care system fails to meet the needs of its older, vulnerable citizens. In Darwin, in the Northern Territory, powerful evidence was heard about the stark challenges faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This included challenges of poverty, food insecurity, difficulties accessing services, lack of culturally safe and secure services and the distance from services. And overall, the report found that a fundamental overhaul of the design, objectives, regulation and funding of aged care in Australia is required. It does not deliver uniformly safe and quality care is unkind and uncaring towards older people, and in too many instances it neglects them. For First Nations people, we look at our old people as our elders. We treat them with utmost respect, knowing that they carry a wealth of knowledge of our stories, our stories as a people, our stories as a family. And today we hear 457 elders of our Australian community have died. And still we do not see any accountability with this government. No changes in the care for our elders, our elder Australians, no care in the desperate need for what has to happen now but not even the recognition of what they could have done so much sooner. The warnings were definitely there. Aged care is a federal responsibility, full stop. This government has withheld support from the sector. You are responsible for aged care, and you haven't protected our elders from this coronavirus. Scott Morrison has no plan to address the crisis in aged care. Anthony Albanese does have a plan. It includes the introduction of minimum staffing levels, adequate supplies of personal protective equipment, better training for staff and infection control, as well as a better surge workforce strategy. The Australian public has lost confidence in Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I just remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Minister Rustin to my question regarding JobSeeker. And specific question was about how many people are likely to default on their mortgage or not be able to pay their rent and be in rental stress when the job seeker payment is cut by $300 a fortnight. And the minister couldn't answer because they don't know. They haven't bothered to look at how this cut of $300 a fortnight is going to impact on 1.8 million job seekers and those on youth allowance, and in fact the 2.2 million Australians who are getting the coronavirus supplement because it's going to have a devastating impact. And we heard that today when we heard from the Ben Phillips from the ANU and the work that they've been doing, looking at the fact that 740,000 people are going to be dropped back into poverty 
at the end of September when $300 are cut from the supplement. We are still going to be in economically difficult times for a very long time to come. So cutting the coronavirus supplement by $300 a fortnight is going to have substantial impact not only in dropping people back below the poverty line, but it is also going to have a devastating impact on our economy. Where are people that are in rental stress going to be living? They, in fact, are going to be homeless. What happens when people have to start defaulting on their home loans? Now, if you look at the work, the ANU work that's been done, poverty has substantially been reduced in this country thanks to the coronavirus supplement, down to 6 per cent. Down to 6 per cent. That's absolutely enormous. So not only has that supplement kept people uh, out of poverty, it's helped our economy. Those people who are going to be now have $300 less a fortnight will be significantly impacted by the cut in the supplement. And of course, the minister once again, once again, would not confirm that they will not drop the job seeker payment back to $40 a day. And the fact that she says it would be irresponsible to guarantee that they that uh, to do that at the moment, to actually uh, confirm that they won't be dropping it down to $40 a day. It's in fact irresponsible not to. It's absolutely irresponsible because I can't think of a world at the moment where it's ever going to be economically justifiable to drop people onto $40 a day. There is no future world where somebody is going to be able to survive on $40 a day. So it's in fact very irresponsible of this government not to confirm to people, not to give people certainty that they will not be dropping people on $40 a day, because it simply is not livable. And the government knew that when they came in in March and, in, and announced that they were going to increase and put in place the coronavirus supplement. And we know what an amazing impact that has had on the community. It's dropped poverty. It's dropped the level of poverty in this country. People are able to put food on the table. They're able to pay their rent. They're able to meet, pay some of their debts. They're actually able to get to the dentist. Somebody's told us that they're able to get to the dentist. Other people have been able to um, start eating much better. They don't have to choose between paying their bills and putting food on the table. They don't have to go without food. They're able to buy their medications because during the inquiry into New Start, now job seeker, we heard very clearly how people are making the choice not to take their medication because they can't afford it. It is literally a choice between taking your medication and putting food on the table for your kids. So, of course, parents are making the choice to go without their medication so that they can feed their kids. That is what this government is going to drop our community back to at the end of September and, even worse, at the end of December, when the government will not guarantee that they won't drop people onto $40 a day. This is causing enormous anxiety and stress to those that are trying to survive on JobSeeker. The government can help those people help their stress, help their anxiety and their mental health by saying, we promise you we will never ever drop you back to $40 a day, because that is unconscionable in this country. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.